Bueno, creo que nuestra siguiente ponencia no necesita presentación. Por algo están todos aquí. ¿Saben quién sigue? Bueno, un aplauso para allá, Dandraka, por favor. So, uh, I suppose my uh, story with science really began when I was about three years old, when uh, I was about to do my very first science experiment. It was a very classic one of taking uh, a bottle of Coke, and then you put some Mentos or candies in it, and it blows up. And so that was my very first experiment, and my mom and dad were all super excited, and we were going to make this giant, like, Coke machine, like, uh, rocket. And tragically for me, I didn't really realize that the Coke rocket was uh, tilted right towards my face. And to be put in the candy, it just slammed straight into my face. So my intro to science was kind of a blast in a literal sense. And uh, I kind of cooled off my opinion to science after that first experiment. But I got back into it. I couldn't get rid of the science bug. And I eventually in sixth grade, I uh, started doing science research again. And I actually started doing science research because of my school held the science fair. And it wasn't like your normal science fair, it was kind of like the event of my middle school. My middle school was literally like one hallway and everyone had to participate in science fair because there was nothing else to do. Like there was no football team, there was no basketball team, nothing. It was science fair or math. And so science fair was kind of like a Hunger Games style science fair where everyone had to participate And then uh, whoever won got a laptop. So of course everyone had to participate and we were all like super competitive because we all wanted that laptop. And my very first project had nothing to do with my current research. It was actually in civil engineering. I was looking at uh, these certain like hydrodynamics and uh, looking at dam and, and structures like that. And uh, I then continued doing science research, and for the very next science fair, I started getting into environmental stuff because I discovered biology, and I was like, biology is just the coolest thing in the world. And so I was using these glowing bacteria, or bioluminescent bacteria, to detect water contaminants. And it was really depressing because I would like culture these bacteria, and they'd like glow, and they were so bright that they'd light up my entire bathroom that I had shifted into like an incubator for these bacteria. And then I just pour these water contaminants on them and they like, essentially their light would slowly go out because they were dying. And so my mom had to photograph this like, kind of like dying process of them like uh, going out because I was at school. And it was really depressing because it was kind of like watching like Tinkerbell die and like Peter Pan. And like my mom was like really sad. She would be like clapping and like crying. And she's like, the light's not coming back. And so. Uh, but, and so I was like really into environmental research at the time. So I kept doing more and more environmental research and I really got into toxicology and I was like, this is my career. I'm going to go into environmental science and it's going to be great. Except oftentimes in life, uh, we run into unexpected barriers. And uh, one day I came home from school and actually I found my mom waiting on the porch. And typically my mom only waits on the porch when like A, my report card comes back and it's bad or other tragic news happens. And it happened that a close family friend who was like an uncle to me, he had basically like taught me all I had known about science, uh, he had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And at the time I didn't really know what pancreas was and cancer was just kind of this scary term I heard in the news and didn't really know anything about. And within the course of six short months, my uncle went from a perfectly healthy, functioning human being to a literal like, human skeleton and then unfortunately passed away. And it was just so shocking to me that a disease could do this to a human, just instantly take them away in six months. And so I, went, I was like wondering, and when, the disease, when this disease had hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers, and using Google and Wikipedia, I found all these statistics on pancreatic cancer. But what I found really, really shocked me. You see, 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when some that's less than a 2% chance of survival. And as I dug deeper, I was wondering, why are we so bad at detecting these cancers? I mean, for breast cancer, we have like the mammogram, and then for prostate cancer, we have the awkward like turn your head and cough test. And, but for pancreatic cancer, there really was nothing. 
And so I was kept digging. I was wondering, why do we have nothing for this disease? And that's why I found even more shocking to statistic. Our current test was 60 years old. I mean, first off, that's older than my dad, but also cost $800 and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have this disease in order to give you this test. And so because of this, the vast majority of these cancers go undiagnosed until it's far too late. And so I was determined to change this, so I set up with eighth grade biology to change the face of cancer diagnostics. It was a bit lofty of a goal, uh, but I was going to do it. And my kind of rationale was the current test sucks so much that anything I do will probably be marginally better. So armed with this kind of go-getter attitude, I set out and I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be effective. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. I was pretty sure I could do this. I wasn't exactly sure how, and so I kept doing more and more research. And that's when I found why we haven't updated our test for pancreatic cancer in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for these cancers, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in protein levels. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but. Because you have liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in thousands of different proteins. And you're looking for this tiny change in this tiny amount of a single protein. It's next to impossible. It's like trying to find a needle in a sack of nearly identical needles. However, unsure due to my teenage optimism, or how some people label it, complete and utter ignorance of the entire field of cancer research, I continued on, and I soon found a database of over 8,000 proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have cancer, when you have pancreatic cancer. And it was my summer break. I had literally nothing else to do, so I just locked myself in my room and researched all 8,000 proteins. And it was a lot like playing Pokemon, except instead of God catch them all, it was God research them all. And so I just became really obsessed with these proteins, and essentially, what I was looking for is I was looking for a bunch of different characteristics because I wanted to find the one biomarker that would be great at detecting pancreatic cancer. So what I would look at is I would go through, and for each protein, I would look at all the scientific literature behind it, all these different studies, and essentially look for, first, where is it found in your body? So is it found in your, your blood, your urine, your spit? Where is it found? Because I really wanted a body fluid that could be easily accessed, like your blood or your urine. I didn't want to be going for, like, Example, for example, like the pancreatic juice, where you have to do a massive surgery in order to diagnose someone, that simply wouldn't be feasible for diagnosing pancreatic cancer. And then I would look, and look at how large of protein levels was the protein found at, and how big of a difference was it between when you didn't have the cancer, when you had some other disease, and when you had the pancreatic cancer. Because I wanted this protein biomarker be really sensitive for pancreatic cancer, so if I detected it, I would pick up every single case of pancreatic cancer. But also what I wanted to do is I wanted to make sure that the test was selective, such that it was only detecting pancreatic cancer, because it'd be really, really bad if I told like, some healthy person they had pancreatic cancer. That just would not be a good thing to do. And then I was also looking at, for example, like how early was this protein found in the stages of the disease? Because you really want to detect these cancers when they're really, really early, even in these precursor lesions, where it's not even cancerous, but it's getting there. Because at these uh, so-called high-grade precursor lesions, that's when survival's at its best, close to 100%. So you really want to detect it there. So I want the protein to be found in these really early stages of the cancer, when survival's at its best. And so then I was going through, and I when it made for some, like, going through all these proteins, this was literally my entire summer break, and it made for some really interesting back-to-school essays. Like, my teachers were like, oh, what did you do this summer? And I was like, oh, I researched proteins. And all my friends did, like, normal things, like went swimming or stuff like that. And so there's always an awkward pause when I was like, oh, I researched proteins, and then I never struck the name protein kid. But I kept going, and on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I finally found the one protein that could work. And the name of this protein was called mesothelin. And it's just your ordinary, run-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer. In which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. 
but also the key is, is that's found in those very early stages of pancreatic cancer, when survival's at its best. And so if I could detect this protein, I could detect the cancer when patients would survive when they were diagnosed. But now the question was, how on earth am I going to detect this protein? And my answer came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. Me and my biology teacher hated each other because I was like, Psh, I know biology. And she was like, you should pay attention in my class and do your work. And so one day I decided to rebel against uh, the teacher and I smuggled in an article on single-walled carbon nanotubes. You could really tell I was like the bad kid in school. I would like rebel by bringing in like scientific articles instead of like getting a tattoo. And so I essentially uh, single-walled carbon nanotubes, these are really kind of the coolest things ever. These, they're these long, thin tubes of carbon, they're single atom thick, and they're 150,000 the diameter of a single strand of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. For example, they're stronger than steel and can conduct electricity better than copper. So I was literally obsessed with these things. So instead of like Justin Bieber posters, I had like giant binders full of articles about carbon nanotubes. And my parents were like, this obsession is a bit odd, but okay, we'll go with it. And so I was reading, I had smuggled in this article on single walled carbon nanotubes. I felt pretty sneaky. I had it wedged between the pages of my biology textbook, reading about all these properties, had that under my desk. And at the same time, we we're learning about these things called antibodies. An antibody, it's kind of like a lock and key. It will only react to one specific protein. In this case, that cancer biomarker I had found. And I was just sitting there, kind of rolling over this idea of how am I going to detect pancreatic cancer, when all of a sudden it hit me. You could combine these two concepts, and what you end up with is a network of nanotubes that's laced with these antibodies. And this essentially creates a carbon substance that will only react to one specific protein due to that antibody. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, it will actually change how electricity flows through it based on the amount of protein present, and thus indicate whether or not someone has pancreatic cancer. And measuring this change in electrical properties is as simple as stealing a $50 ohm meter from your dad's garage and not telling him about it for a month. And he was like, oh, where, where's my ohm meter? I'm like, what, what's an ohm meter? I've, I've never seen one of those. And eventually he found out and I had to get my own ohm meter, which was like an awkward conversation. But I continued on. And how this sensor essentially is working is it's, imagine it like a giant bowl of spaghetti noodles. And when you put meatballs in there, it will spread these neighboring noodles apart and thus cause less connections between individual noodles. So if you imagine those noodles as carbon nanotubes, and the meatballs as antibodies, what's happening is when the antibody reacts with this protein, it forms these beefed up molecules that spread these neighboring nanotubes apart and cause less connections between each nanotube. And this results in less connections between these nanotubes and thus less pathways for electrons to take when you run an electrical current through it. And because of this, the resistance will go up because there's less pathways, because it's like trying to take all of you guys and stuff you through one door instead of seven. A lot more difficult. And so then I was thinking, well, these networks of nanotubes, they're very flimsy. And since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper, and making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I personally love. If I ever do a bad on a test, those cookies will be gone, or the ice cream, depending on how bad I did. But literally all you do is you take some water, you pour the nanotubes in, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. It's literally as simple as that. And then as soon as I come up with this idea, I was like kind of jumping around in my seat. I was like, oh my gosh, this is the coolest thing ever. But at the same time, my biology teacher, I swear she has like eyes on the back of her head. She whirls around all red in the face, storms up to my desk, snatches this article, and is like, what is this actual science doing in my classroom? This is a place for the boring regurgitation of knowledge, not actual science. At least that's what I think she said. She probably said something more along the lines like, do your homework or else I'll fail you. But I had to like eventually after class beg her to get this article back. And I, like, she gave me this massive lecture on respecting myself and others. And I'm like, all I really want is my article back. Please be quiet. And eventually I got it back. And then I could start doing research again and investigating this kind of promising idea. And that's when 
I came across this realization that I really needed a lab to do this research. I couldn't really do cancer research on my kitchen countertop. Like, me and my brother had done some pretty crazy things, and because of that, my mom had kind of outlawed us from doing scientific experiments in the house. Like, for example, one time we had to evacuate the house because me and my brother accidentally had uh, uh, like an escape of chlorine gas in our basement. And so we had to evacuate the house after that. Uh, we also cultured E. coli and cholera, where we make our sandwiches in the morning. But you can't, really can't blame me. Like, the stove is a really great place for, like, sterilizing equipment. And really, the only downside was my dad got cholera for a week. So, like, net positive, I suppose. And then, like, also me and my brother would make, like, these high-voltage electronics in our basement that blew out not only our entire development's power for a week, but also knocked out my brother for, like, at least a couple of hours. And our neighbors were like, what happened to the power? Like, those transformers, they're just on the fritz these days, you know? And finally, I think, like, the kind of last straw for my poor mother was we landed her on the FBI watch list because of our online shopping history. Uh, we, first off, we ordered, uh, like, all these, like, different chemicals and synthesized uh, nitroglycerin on our stovetop. And nitroglycerin is a really high-grade explosive. So a single drop of it can blow up a brick. And we made a liter of it. And we're like, we have no clue what to do with this. Like, our parents can't find out about this. They were, like, out of the house for a while doing something. And so we're just, but also we were kind of curious, just how big of an explosion will this make? So to solve both dilemmas, we just tossed it off our second floor and out into our backyard. And it ended up blowing a 40-foot-wide crater. So it's like about like 15 meters wide crater that was three meters deep. And that was really hard to hide from our parents. We failed miserably. And also kind of worsening the fact was the fire marshal literally lived right next door. And he shut down our Andrika rocketry program pretty fast. So he really lost it when we uh, blew a giant crater in our backyard. And then also, uh, probably another thing that got us on the FBI watch list was we ordered a giant vat of uranium that was, like, this big. And you, it was, like, from a really sketchy Russian website, but, like, you really can't blame us. It was all on sale. Like, it was 50% off. It was clearance. So, like, it was totally worth it. But after that, my mom was like, you can't order cancer cells. And I was like, I couldn't really, like asked for cancer cells for Christmas, so I was like, I need the lab to do this research. So I then wrote up this email, I drafted an email, I, I attached this 30-page long behemoth of a document outlining each and every aspect of my procedure. I send it out, and I sent it to 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University in the National Institutes of Health. And I sit back, I was expecting to get all these positive emails, I'd be able to pick and choose uh, which lab I'd work in, be hailed as like, boy, wonder saves the world. And then reality struck. I got 199 rejections. And uh, I realized professors aren't nearly as nice as glowing profile pictures make them seem online. Like, one professor was like all smiling and stuff, and then they proceeded to tell me that I absolutely sucked at science and should investigate doing a job in a different career. And so some of them were just absolutely brutal, but eventually I finally got one positive response from Dr. Anderbaum Maecha at Johns Hopkins University. But also, during that time of getting, like, 199 rejections, it was, like, this really dark point of, like, my project because, like, I, I could take, like, my parents telling me no, my bio teacher telling me no. I didn't really care about their opinions. But 199 of, like, the foremost cancer researchers being, like, your idea sucks. I was, like, oh, my gosh, maybe it does. But I kept pushing, and finally that one professor, Dr. Maitra, accepted me into his lab, or, well, accepted me for an interview. I first had to go through that. And uh, essentially, I went in for this big interview, kind of my most professional attire, sweatpants and a hoodie. I'd just come from swim practice, so my hair was a hot mess. I go in expecting like a normal interview, like, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? What are you interested in? This guy has PhD in nanomedicine and couldn't bamboozle him like my parents. Like, my parents, I'm just like, cancer, carbon nanotubes, and they're like, go do your science, Jack. This guy brought 28 PhDs plus himself into this three meter by three meter room, and we prize at some Guinness Book of World Record for like population density. And they just proceeded to just like bombard me with questions. And 
I really had no clue what they were talking about. My knowledge of cancer biology was a six-month crash course I had given myself using Google and Wikipedia. And so I just guessed on all these questions. I guessed C, just like I did on my college admissions tests. It worked out in both cases, it seemed. And I finally landed the lab space I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized I sucked at cancer research. Like, I went in the very first day, and you could, pot, you could not possibly have a worse first day in a lab than me. Because I go in, and I'm super, super excited. I'm like, all right, I'm going to change the world today. And I go in, and I'm like, all right, let's do some science. And so then I realized I had no clue what I was doing. And so I just followed around this postdoc uh, student around for about like two hours because I was afraid to touch anything because like if I did, it would like break and there goes my college tuition. So I just followed this postdoc around. He was in charge of making sure I didn't like blow up the lab. The FBI probably tipped off my professor being like, you need to keep an eye on this kid. And then what happened is he was just like, after two hours, he's like, okay, Jack, you actually have to do something while you're here. So he sat me down and he's like, culture some cancer cells. And culturing cancer cells is literally the easiest thing to do in the world. What you do is you take fluid from one flask and you pour it in another flask. I sneezed in my second flask. Thought, cancer, it's really hard to kill off it. It's like an immune system or something. There are like tentacles going out the next day and just kind of hid under my lab bench and kept feeding it out of my curiosity of how large it would get. And I eventually like, kind of like made it into my like lab pet. So instead of like a hamster or a gerbil, I had like this weird like monstrosity bacteria and mold in my uh, like bench top. And I named it Bob and it was like really cute and I'd like give it treats. And then my professor finally like discovered this and he's like, this is just a very blatant like violation of like biosafety. And so then Bob had to be uh, killed with some chlorine and I had to bury him in my backyard. But, oh, oh, there we go. And so then what happened is I proceeded to like mess up literally every single procedure. Like I'd accidentally trip on my shoelaces and blow up my cells or blow them up in the centrifuge or overheat them in the incubator. It was really, really awful. I was just like completely the worst like researcher in the world. And I probably committed cellular genocide on some level, but the UN hasn't been after me on those charges, so we're all good. But I continued on and like I would just fail horribly every single time. But what really kept me going was that 100 people die of pancreatic cancer every single day. So I'd always go into the lab thinking, how am I going to help save those 100 lives today? And I really think that could be generalized to my strategy in science in general is you always have to keep what your, like, your main goal in mind and keep motivated by that. And always remember what you're doing your research for. And so that really helped me push through those dark times where I'd like, just mess up every single procedure. And finally, at the end of seven months, I ended up with this one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. And this makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage, when something that's close to 100% chance of survival. And so far in preclinical trials on patients with and without the cancer, it has close to 100% accuracy at detecting these cancers in the earliest stages. And so in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rate from 5.5% to close to 100%, and do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. You can simply switch out that antibody, as simple as switching out chalk chips for bar scotch chips and cookies, and detect an entirely different disease. So you can detect things ranging from Alzheimer's, other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. The possibilities are literally endless. And nowadays, I'm currently at Stanford University, and I'm doing research on these things. Uh, so I'm double majoring in electrical engineering as well as chemistry. And my current research focuses on two different things, uh, the first of which is developing these uh, kind of what we call color-changing biosensors. They're kind of like a pH strip, but for whatever you want. So first off, uh, on a, essentially a like, piece of paper the size of a postage stamp, you can detect 20 different water contaminants simultaneously. You just dip in the water, take it out, and within one minute, and for one one hundred thousandth of a penny, you can detect 20 different water contaminants down to part per trillion dyes. So that's the equivalent 
of having a single drop of contaminated water in the size of an Olympic pool. And so it's really, really sensitive, and then you just take a picture of it on, a smartphone, on your smartphone, and using this app I program, you can instantly see what's in your water. And the same goes for diseases. You can detect things ranging from tuberculosis, to malaria, to Zika, to Ebola, all these different diseases and all these different water contaminants, and just instantly know what's in your blood, what, what's ailing you, or what's in your water. And then what you can do is, with this data, I essentially, when, each time a user uses the app, it'll geotag and timestamp that data point, and it can upload it to a map. And essentially, then, I can see exactly where certain contaminants are coming from. And so, for example, in a lot of African nations, after structural adjustment, they are unable to do environmental monitoring. And so now what you can do is, using these, you can crowdsource environmental monitoring and be able to hold these transnational corporations responsible and prevent them from exploiting the environment. And so it's really, really exciting what you can do there. But also with the health-based sensors, what you can do is you can actually track the spread of an epidemic. So for example, in the Ebola epidemic, you would be able to see exactly where certain uh, strains of the virus are going and how to best treat them and deploy your resources such that you can smartly combat the epidemic, which is really, really exciting. And this kind of like revolution of big data and science is really changing the game, especially for public health. Recently in... Uh, Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, there's this large kind of uh, like uh, initiative where essentially there were a lot of different asthma attacks that were happening. And so what my team and I did is we worked with the mayor there and we were essentially able to see and look at all the, using weather, like using openly available data, we were able to see exactly where certain pockets of like particulate matter were and where these asthma attacks were. And we were able to inform the mayor essentially how to redistribute his resources and because of that, 27% people have less, uh, there's 27% less asthma attacks in that city. And so nowadays, using this publicly available data, anyone can go out there and change the world. You can simply go online to data.gov and instantly see publicly available data and play with it and be able to like, create these giant like, projects and be able to change the world, really, using publicly available data and just hacking it. And so th that was my first part of my project, is using big data plus these sensors for environmental and public health. And my second project is on these things called nanorobots. And these are essentially these super small robots I program using DNA. And they'll actually go into your bloodstream and they'll learn how to treat your cancer the same way that me or you might learn a math equation. Because what I program them with is an artificial neural network. So that means they learn the same way the human brain does. And essentially, they'll optimize your cancer treatment so you can combine five different cancer drugs at different dosages to really personalize your cancer treatment and make sure you have the best possible outcome. But also, they evolve with your cancer as it develops resistance, such that the treatment is always effective. And what we found in a six-week clinical trial or a preclinical trial in mouse models, we were able to shrink the tumor size by 95% in just six weeks. And this is massive especially for pancreatic cancer, because that means, for example, let's say you have a metastatic cancer that's spread all around these body. This, uh, these near robots, they essentially use your circulatory system to track down the cancer like smart homing missiles. And unlike surgery, they're able to get every single cancer cell, regardless of where it is, instantly killing it and strategizing and chattering with all the near robots to strategize how to best kill that cancer cell. And so, for example, in these like, unresectable cancers that you can't do surgery on, this uh, test would, or this technology would be able to shrink them to a size where you could just do surgery, and then you'd be able to have this follow-up and potentially be able to cure cancer. And we found that worked not only on pancreatic cancer, it also worked on breast cancer, ovarian cancer, and lung cancer. And we're testing on more cancers in the coming years, which is really, really exciting. But also, they're able to do all these really advanced computational functions. So a single milliliter of them has 10 times the computational power as your iPhone. And so they're able to do all these amazing logic gates and calculations. And for example, in the future, we're going to have them model your cancer and strategize how best to attack it even more. And simultaneously, what they can do is they can actually do what we call precise gene therapy or surgery almost on your genes. We're essentially using this new technology of CRISPR where they can essentially take out or like, they can insert or delete certain genes at a whim. And so what you can do is that can make your cancer cells go green, for example, so a surgeon could see them during surgery. Or what you could do 
is I could make your cancer more susceptible to certain treatments when it becomes resistant to that treatment. I could take out that cancer-resistant drug. But also what I could do is I could essentially, we've tested this on about eight mice with uh, type 1 diabetes, and we found that I was able to reverse many of the symptoms of type 1 diabetes within a, a, about a three-month period. And so with this technology, you can begin to cure these like, hereditary diseases and improve health in a lot of these previously untreatable diseases, which is really, really exciting. And for me, uh, my projects really speak to how I view engineering which is, and being an engineer, which is, as an engineer, I feel as if I have a responsibility to design for all, which means typically a lot of times in science, you typically design only for a very select few. We see this in medical technology, where a lot of these new upcoming like cancer therapies are just inhibitively expensive. I mean, they cost like thousands and thousands of dollars. But for me, I believe in designing uh, medical therapies, medical treatments, environmental sensors for everyone, such that everyone can have the exact same access to healthcare. Because, I mean, healthcare just seems like a basic human right to me. And I believe as an engineer, it's my responsibility to address those concerns of everyone, not just a very small market. And this kind of translate, like we're seeing this kind of like giant medical revolution where we're having all these very inexpensive technologies. So for example, we can sequence your entire genome for under $1,000, which was previously unheard of. So in probably the next three years, you're probably going to be able to sequence your entire genome for under $10. But also, we're having all these revolutions and new biosensors. So for example, my pancreatic cancer biosensor and that poached the stamp size biosensor are really herald heralding in this new era of medicine where we're able to precisely treat your disease and personalize your treatment such that your treatment is tailored exactly for your needs and will work best for you. And that to me is the most exciting thing where we combine this big data, this personalized treatment, all of these sensors, and novel therapies like these near robots to have the best possible outcome. So I think within the next 10 years, we're going to have, be able to treat all these diseases that were previously untreatable, such as cancer and Ebola and all these other diseases, which is really, really exciting and will really help us lead all healthier and happier lives. But simultaneously, there's a lot of barriers that stand in the way of this medical revolution, really the scientific revolution in general, where this big data is being locked up and you can't get access to the knowledge because essentially what happens is there are these things called paywalls. And I mean, on my journey, I faced a lot of difficulties. I got told no by my professor. I got told no by my teachers. I got told no by literally everyone. But one of the biggest things that led to was my biggest roadblock were these paywalls, where you essentially have to cough up $35 per article in order to read a scientific article. And so we have all these big, like, and that makes doing scientific research inhibitively expensive. I mean, especially for young people such as ourselves, I don't have $35 to shell out every now and then. And we see all these big STEM initiatives that say we need more kids interested in science. But when a seminal science article costs $35 and a Taylor Swift single costs 99 cents, that's a bit of a mixed message. And this isn't just a problem for young researchers, this is a problem for everyone. You see, recently, Harvard University released a statement to its faculty and students that essentially stated, we simply can't afford continuing to pay for these scientific articles, some of which are $40,000 per year. And what does it say about the world of academic publishing, the accessibility of knowledge, and the flow of information? When Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford to continue paying for its subscriptions. By having these paywalls, we've instituted this very rigid class hierarchy in terms of knowledge, where your access to scientific information is delegated by how much money you or your institution has. And so at the top, we have these knowledge elites, such as like Harvard, Yale, all these big name in institutions and like labs that can afford all these different articles. But even among those, we have a bit of stratification, where at the top, we have the knowledge billionaires, those big name institutions like Stanford, Harvard, Yale, that can afford all these subscriptions because they have these multi-billion dollar endowments. But then lower down, we have these state-run institutions that don't have a large of endowments and thus can't afford the same articles. And because of this, we've essentially created this tier-based way for disseminating knowledge, where your access to knowledge is relegated by how much money you or your university has and it simply isn't effective and it isn't conducive to doing science. It prevents collaborations and really stymies future scientific innovation. And then lower down we have the knowledge middle class, people like you or me. We can like read a few of the open access articles out there and maybe buy an article if we really, really want to. 
But then lower down, we have the knowledge underclass, those 5.5 billion people who lack access to the internet and are living in knowledge poverty. So essentially what we have is a knowledge aristocracy, where only 0.008% of the world's population, those are the only people who can access scientific information. And then lower down, we have the knowledge underclass, 85% of the world's population, 5.5 billion people who can't access scientific information and are living in knowledge poverty. So it's like taking 80 people off the streets of Guadalajara and saying, you guys are the only ones who can access scientific information, everyone else, too bad for you. And imagine if instead we could live in a knowledge democracy, where what you look like, age or gender, doesn't matter. Whether you're from Mexico to China, to from Canada to Malaysia, it wouldn't matter if you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day. You'd have the exact same access to information. Because science shouldn't be a luxury, and knowledge shouldn't be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. And the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few who can afford these articles. Because a Harvard professor, or a girl who's living in like, rural Afghanistan, should have the exact same access as a preeminent Nobel laureate at Harvard University. Not because it's economically sound, because it's the right thing to do. And it's what we call equality. And one of the solutions to some of the world's greatest problems, from the energy crisis to cancer, they could be locked inside the brains of someone who doesn't have access to the right resources and thus can't fully flesh out their idea. And it would be a shame if we let that human potential go raised. Right now, we're wasting 85% of the world's scientific prowess. 85% of the world's population can't do innovation. And we desperately need to change that. We need to lift everyone to the exact same access, such that anyone can afford these open access articles, and such that these paywalls come down and that anyone can do science. Because at that point, that's when true innovation will happen, when there is true knowledge equality and everyone can collaborate equally. And I believe that we can do this. Because think, if a 13-year-old who didn't know what a pancreas was could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer, just imagine what you could do. Thank you. So I think now I get to throw a like, box at you guys. I think, maybe. Here it comes, yes. Sweet, all right, who has a question? Question, question, question. Sorry, I'm also like, kind of blind because like, I hadn't put in my contacts. All right, right there. Really bad at throwing. <laughs> Oh, uh, hola. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, it was very interesting for me to hear you. I have already saw your TV talk. It was very good and very noble what you said at the end of your presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> and my question is, um, I'm studying nanotechnology. I'm in my first year. And what my teachers have told me about these nano robots, it's not too much. And I was, uh, if you could tell me a little bit more, I have some questions. Like, for example, uh, if these nano robots are autonomous or if they can send information, and how do you program it? Like, what are the bases, let's say? So, essentially, how these nano robots work are they're kind of trigger release. So, what happens is when they come into contact with a protein, they essentially rupture and release their contents. And so it's kind of like a mini smart bomb. But the cool thing about these is that inside of them, you can encapsulate certain messages in like DNA. So that DNA can go and activate or inactivate other robots. And it can do all these different functions of logic gate. So for example, you can do OR, AND, uh, you can do XOR. And also, you can do control flow functions such as while loops and for loops, which is really, really exciting because that was the first time in the world that that has ever happened. And uh, essentially, what happens with them is uh, you're using these uh, DNA to essentially lock them. And so the DNA is used to say essentially what they'll react to. Uh -huh. But um, 
They can also, so they can send information. They can also be used for diagnostics. For example, let's say they come into contact with the cancer cell. They can essentially upregulate that signal. So the cancer cell will open one type of nano robot, which will then lead to a cascade where it will react with more nano robots, more nano robots, and release a certain signal into your bloodstream that a doctor can pick up and easily detect even single cancer cells. But also, they can be used for these things called theranostics where essentially the remnants of these nano robots will be used to tag cells such that a cancer can see, the, or such that a doctor can see the cancer using an MRI. And so there's a bunch of really interesting applications there. So they're autonomous, but you can also send information in. So there's kind of this give and take that the doctor can do with them where he can, tell, like, where he can like, update the instructions and uh, then also just let the nano robots kind of take care of the cancer. Can you repeat again the name of the thing that it assembles? It, 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 uh, I didn't hear you very well when you have the nanorobot and it dissembles when it happens. So, um, where it's being used to diagnose someone? No, no, I'm just like trying to know a little bit more about the science. Oh, yeah. so um, kind of how they work is, uh, so I'm going to start throwing out some sci like yeah. weird science jargon. So essentially what you do, is you take, uh, you use polyethylene glycol and you coat uh, iron oxide nanoparticles in that. And then using an EDC NHS reaction, you can essentially cross link uh, aptamers to the surface of these nanoparticles. And then you create what's called a double Pickering's emulsion. And how you do this is you take water and you preload whatever you're going to put into the nano robots in there. And then you put that into essentially a giant bath of oil. In this case, it's dichloromethane. And what will happen is when you homogenize that, it will create these little bubbles of water inside oil. And these, nano, these uh, nanoparticles, what's really interesting about them, is they'll naturally self-assemble at that interface. And then what happens is you put that into another bath of water, re-homogenize it, and so what you get is water, nanoparticles, oil, nanoparticles, water. And then you stir it really vigorously at a high heat, and so all that oil evaporates. And then these uh, nanoparticles just kind of squish together. And then you have this nanorobot that you can use for detecting the cancer. And so it'll essentially, uh, when it comes to contact with the cancer cell or whatever protein I programmed it to react to, it'll essentially blow up and release its cargo. And then the DNA inside of it can go and talk to other nanorobots. And so these nanorobots can exchange uh, information and do all these really advanced computational functions, as well as treat your cancer, which is really exciting. Thanks. All right, next question. All right. Uh, hi. Hi. My name is Senyal. I'm a software developer. Uh, it's really interesting what you do. I just have a really quick question. You have uh, further in the future to uh, make uh, maybe neural network to work with all these robots because they all send a lot of da data uh, every single time. You, you, you the data are... robots sending the data? Yeah, I mean art artificial intelligence. Actually, I'm talking about even if if you can make this possible. I mean, if you can make a neural network between your robots, you can actually maybe prevent some illness. I don't know if you think about it or... Yeah, this one, that's one of the... Uh, oh, is this on? Yeah, all right. Is this on? There we go. So uh, one of the really exciting things about these nanorobots is that they can have like, kind of this memory and be able to react to different uh, like diseases. So what you can essentially do is you can almost make them as a secondary, smarter immune system, where essentially they can go in and like go all around your body. So for example, they can attack HIV AIDS, they can attack these previously untreatable diseases like diabetes and things like that, and uh, kind of complement your uh, immune system, making this kind of new era of preventative medicine. And that's one of the really exciting things to me, uh, because it's much cheaper to treat, uh, to prevent uh, a disease rather than treat it and react to it. And so that's one of the things that's really coming in is with this personalized medicine and these personalized treatments, you're able to prevent the disease before it even happens. All right. Hi, Jack. 
Hi. <laughs> First, uh, I, I admire your work. I think it's so great, so cool. Uh, my question is, uh, it's all about all the students. For example, all of these people maybe have problems in their classes, for example, with the teachers, and maybe them are working in some project, one idea that then believe this so incredible, so important, and maybe can change the world. But um, a lot of, of people, inclusive or parents or something like that, don't think that and don't believe in you. And what is your advice for find that balance of if you think it's possible to make that idea, that project, and maybe the people with you are working, not what is your advice to find that balance of keep moving and don't lose your mind with your idea? So, um, I mean, it's kind of something that you have to have a gut feeling of. You have to kind of make the snap decision of, do you want to continue with this idea or not? And do you believe in it or not? And if you don't fully believe in your idea, I mean, who else is going to believe in it? Because you're going to be the greatest advocate for your idea. So if you don't believe in it, then no one else will. So you have to make the decision on your own of whether or not you want to go with it. And if you do go with it, don't take no for an answer. Keep pushing, because it only takes one yes to have a breakthrough. And always uh, be optimistic, in my opinion. I mean, I, like, oftentimes the greatest scientific innovations can come from the most unexpected places. And so you could have the next world-changing idea. So never doubt yourself. But occasionally, it is wise to take a step back and see how feasible an idea is. I have to do say that. Uh, so for example, one time in 10th grade, uh, I thought I was going to make uh, something called a Raman spectrometer really cheap and be able to diagnose disease with it. But the problem was, is I'm a bio person and a chemistry person. I absolutely suck at physics. And a Raman spectrometer is literally all physics. And so I struggled and struggled and struggled and beat my head against the wall. And eventually I realized this isn't for me. And you really do kind of feel it in your gut that you're like, if you're not enjoying it, if you don't believe in your idea, don't follow through with it. But if you do believe in it, if you are loving it, always push through because I got 199 rejections. Everyone told me no, but I kept pushing because I loved my idea. I believed in it, and I was able to create this new way to attack pancreatic cancer. Hi. Um, you, you were telling that when you were in, no, it was in high school, when, when you were little, you had like a lot of promotion of science fairs and all those things. And I think that that was something very important for you to begin in, in this great path. So how do you think that schools or governments should try to improve like science programs? I mean, for kids dreaming of being a great scientist and not maybe like only great in sports or things like that. So for us to have more 13 years old, that will be like the future of everything, not only medicine. Uh, yeah, because uh, that, that's why I was so excited to come here because it's really at these events where there's a bunch of young people interested in innovation and change in the world. That's where real change happens. I mean, that's where at Science Fairs, I came up with some of the greatest collaborations in my career. I was able to talk to other young people and learn from them and exchange ideas and bounce ideas off of them. And you make amazing connections here and you make really lifelong friends, in my opinion. And so uh, government sponsoring these uh, events and these kind of science-directed programs is absolutely critical for uh, not only like the scientific success, but also economic success, because science and education are the best long-term investments a government can, can make in terms of the economy. And so always uh, like come to these events, always talk to other young people, and always try to change the world. All right. Hi. Uh, do you think that your nanorobots can help the people that, for example, have Huntington or there was some mm, degenerating uh, sickness that makes the muscles come to bones and no, no move for them? Yeah, so um, 
Huntington's is actually a disease that's very close to my heart. Uh, my grandfather, unfortunately, passed of it and it runs in my family. So me and my mom still have no clue if we have it. So uh, it's definitely a disease that is on the forefront of my mind. And that's one of the really exciting things about uh, these nanorobots is that they could potentially uh, be able to remove those faulty genes and be able to essentially make it such that people that do have the Huntington gene can live normal, happy, healthy lives without any of the repercussions that you typically face. And that's one of the most exciting things is that you can treat these previously untreatable diseases and make it such that everyone can live a long, happy life. Let me get a question from this side. All right. Ooh, close enough. <laughs> hey, I would like to thank you very much for your work and for your um, benefits that you're contributing to humanity. It's an, an astounding job. Now, what I, wa what I would like to ask is maybe a, a little bit of a controversial question. Um, one of the biggest killers when it comes to illicit substances is not knowing when, when the user doesn't know what he is consuming or at what potency. So I'd like to know how easy or how hard it would be to adapt the sensors that, you're, that you are using to detect pollutants in water to detect other substances and their concentrations. Uh, so that's one of the really exciting things about the biosensors that I create is essentially uh, you can tailor them to detect anything. So you could easily make it such that you could detect an entirely different uh, like water contaminant, an entirely different disease, or even something else such as like a different chemical and like a biochemical process. As long as I have a piece of DNA that will react to it, I can create a biosensor. And you can always create a piece of DNA that will react to it because there are these things called aptamers. They're essentially like antibodies, but they're made out of DNA and are a lot uh, more replicable and a lot more stable. And so that's why I love using them. Uh, because like antibodies, if you put them out, like they'll be like, oh, I'm denatured, I'm useless. While ant optimers can survive up to like temperatures of like 100 degrees uh, Celsius, they can uh, survive freezing, they can, they can shake them, you can do so much to them and they won't break it or denature. So I love those ones. But what you can do is there's actually this process, it's called selects. And it's essentially where you use principles of natural selection to create these sequences of uh, DNA that will react specifically to one uh, certain chemical agent. So what you do is you essentially take a like, plate and, or like a Petri dish and you coat it with whatever chemical you want. And then what happens is you pass over just a giant amount of DNA sequences, typically 10 to the 18th different DNA sequences. You incubate it and then you wash off all of the unbound DNA and then what you do is you unbind all the other DNA that was attached to these different, uh, to the like molecule that you put on there. And then you use what's called polymerase chain reaction to uh, replicate those DNA. And you keep doing this over and over and over again until you kind of naturally select the, the best DNA sequence. And so you really can create aptamer or and then a sensor for really anything you want. Other questions? Oh, so close. Hi. Um, so you talked very briefly about gene modification. My question is, um, what, are you, what are your opinion on gene modification of humans? I mean, where do you think is the moral line between, um, I mean, editing a song, uh, all of that? I mean, <laughs> what are your thoughts on gene modification of humans? I think. Uh, so. There's definitely a lot of controversy about uh, genetically modified organisms or GMOs um, and also in humans. So, for example, you have a bunch of ethical issues about like designer babies and things like that. And for me, I as an engineer will always create tools that people can use. And a scientific tool can be used for good or evil. And uh, it's up to the people and the governments and the doctors to be able to decide to use the tools that I create for good. Uh, but going along that thing, that topic, I feel as if, as an engineer, I have a fundamental responsibility to make sure that my technologies that I use aren't disproportionately aimed at uh, doing bad things. However, these nanorobots in modifying genes and things like that 
I believe the applications of them are far greater, like the good far outweighs the bad that they could cause. Um, so for example, through proper regulation and proper government oversight, we can definitely apply these in very interesting and beneficial ways. Uh, I, especially with, there has been a lot of controversy with genetically modified organisms, uh, especially with organizations such as Greenpeace arguing that they're harmful for the environment, but in reality, genetic modification is a tool that you can use to first off boost crop yields so to combat like poverty and hunger. You can also use it uh, to make to like get rid of genetic diseases in humans. You can use it for so much good, and I believe that there's so little uh, recourse for the applications that I, in my opinion, genetic modification is valid, like valid. Microphone, box, thing. Oh, yay. All right. Oh, sorry. Oh, geez. Hi. I want to know if there are any biomedical engineers working with you with those nanorobots. Say the question again. I want to know if there are any biomedical engineer working with you. So um, I live actually. So I was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and then moved to Baltimore. So I live in inner city Baltimore, uh, which can be an interesting experience sometimes. But um, so where where I was born, like. So now I go to Stanford University, and there are definitely a lot of biomedical engineers there. However. Uh, I'm not studying biomedical engineering because I heard from one of my mentors, and take this with a grain of salt, typically bioengineers, biomedical engineers, they, you often get an education, especially at my school, uh, where it's a mile wide and an inch deep, and you can't really use that for a lot of really interesting applications. So uh, because you don't have enough chemistry or biology knowledge or not enough engineering expertise. So for me, that's why I chose electrical engineering with double major in chemistry because it mixes my passion of doing nanotechnology and biology and to a nice, really uh, kind of, uh, it gives me the knowledge to be able, and the tools to be able to develop these new technologies. Sorry, I failed. <laughs> I want to ask you something. Uh, with all of distraction in this world, how you could keep focus in your goals with all of that things? Say it again. Ah, I'm sorry. Sorry, my hearing is awful. <laughs> how you keep focus in your goals ah, all with right. all the distraction in this world? So, um, of course, I do like normal things. Like, I go to the movies and, like, of course, I play video games and stuff like that and, like, binge watch Netflix. So, like, uh, I, I do have the occasional procrastination moment, uh, but I have to say that overall, I keep focused on my goals because I absolutely love what I do. For me, doing science is uh, just the funnest thing in the world, and it's just so cool. And I'm like, always so excited to wake, like even when you wake up at like 6.30 a.m. to go into the lab at 7 and then work all the way until like 12, at like midnight. I just love doing science. It's like just, it, it kind of gives me energy and uh, I don't know, it just makes every day like the happiest time of my life. And uh, I, I think that everyone should aspire to find something that makes them that happy uh, because once you do and you find a job in it, going to work will be the funnest thing ever. So, yes, do that. Uh, and that's how I stay focused on my goals, because they're really, really fun. Other, oh, and I believe that was the last question. So thank you so much, and go out there and change the world.